Hey, what's up, class? I'm Craig. I'm Francisco Bo. And we're going to present you chapter 1, 2, 3. I start with chapter 1. He's going to do chapter 2, and then we split chapter 3, 50, 50. He's going to leave the video, and I continue with the chapter 1. Enjoy. So, the first question we all have to answer is, what patterns do you see, and what types of countries dominate these routes in terms of export routes, forecast for potential uh, growth, um, and yes, we did some research and came up with some information. So, um, one key trend is the continued rise of emerging markets, particularly in Asia. As we all could expect, Asia is growing, the economy is growing, they are likely to become e increasingly important source of demand for goods and services. In addition, the growth of e-commerce and digital trade may open up new opportunities for businesses of all sizes to access global markets. Another factor that may drive trade growth is the continued liberalization of trade and investment around the world. The world tries to open barriers and to open boundaries that we can have a smooth trade between different continents, between different countries. So due to this factor, trade might increase because there will be less barriers, there will be less um, stones which um, businesses have to overcome. Hence, um, another factor that may drive trade growth is the continued liberalization of trade, as I said, and investment policies around the world. Things are getting easier for businesses and countries. As barriers to trade and reduced, businesses may be able to more, may be more easily access to new markets and supply chains and competition may increase, driving down prices for consumers. Hence, businesses always try to look for new markets and new consumers, and we're living in an interconnected world, like a kind of a village. Everybody is in contact with everywhere, so due to globalization, businesses from all around the world are connected, and um, this might increase um, competition. You all can expect it will be China, everybody is talking about China, but new countries are also part of the new emerging markets. India and Singapore and Indonesia. Why? Why? Good question. These countries have large and growing populations, increasing levels of consumer spending and relatively low labor costs. Which means businesses can invest in those countries, they can produce in those countries and don't have to pay too much. Um, for their employees. Nevertheless, at the same time, developed countries such as the United States and those in Europe may also continue to be important trading partners, particularly in sections such as high-tech manufacturing, where they have a competitive advantage. We all know the best brands most likely come from Europe or United States. They have a good reputation, made in Germany, made in the US, made in France, so they have a competitive advantage. In, 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 compar in comparison to what's like China. I mean, China is, is, yeah, we know it's cheap, it's affordable, but um, Europe and the United States still has a competitive advantage in terms of high-tech manufacturing. Overall, the future of global trade is likely to be shaped by a complex interplay of factors and businesses that can, that can adapt to changing market conditions and stay ahead of emerging trends and likely to be the most successful. Hence, businesses have to adapt. COVID, new, new generation has certain expectations and new, new ways of living. Businesses have to adapt and it will be always about changing, adapting. And if those businesses can change and adapt to different needs, they will be wired for success. So this is the first part of the question one. Now I move forward to question two. Um, where we talked about the FTE, the Foreign Direct Investment Index. And um, there are sometimes there are conferences about the index, how it can be improved. And the Confidence Index is a survey based that measures the confidence of global executives in the attractiveness of various countries as destinations for foreign direct investment. The index is published initially by a business a global management consulting firm. These publishments are important for businesses and countries to say, hey, where can I invest my next money? Which country is risk-free, I can invest, and which country is 
I don't rather invest because I don't know if I get my money back. Examples. I got a reason what to underline. Why to underline this fact? The index is constructed based on a survey of global executors who are responsible for making investment decisions for their companies. The survey asks executives to rank the countries that are the most likely to invest in over the next three years. There are different factors, including the country's economic prospect, regulation environment, political stability, and labor market. So we can see if there's a country where the politics, they, they prefer democratic, um, the, the country is stable, there are not many riots, there's not so much corruption, they can, they know, I'm going to invest some X and I'm pretty sure I will get my investment back. There's nobody I have to pay that I get my um, money back. There's low rate of corruption. So this is, those are indexes which help businesses and countries to navigate if they're going to, if they're going to invest in this country or not. So the conference index banks countries based on the number of times they are selected as a top investment destination by the survey executors. The ranking is then weighted based on the size of the country's economy so that larger economies have a greater impact on the final ranking. The index provides a useful benchmark for comparing the investment attractiveness of different countries and can help companies to identify new investment opportunities and potential risks. So it helps businesses and countries to just see this might be a good investment, this might be a risk investment. So it just gives kind of a guideline and a kind of tries to bring awareness towards what is good and what is not so good. Thank you very much. Kobe, now to continue. Hey, I am Francisco Cobo. In the chapter two, we were talking about the freedom in the world survey. Uh, that is an annual report published uh, by Freedom House. Uh, this survey uh, evaluates the state of political rights and civil liberties in countries around the world based on a set of objective criteria. This survey measures political rights on a scale of 0 to 40 and civil, and civil liberties on a scale of 0 to 60, with higher scores indicating written uh, freedom. Countries are classified, classified as free, early free and no free based on their overall scores. In the most recent Freedom in the World report for 2021, a total of 195 countries were evaluated, um, and of these, 80, just 84 were classified as free, 63 as partly free, and 48 countries were classified as no free. Uh, the top ranked countries uh, in terms of political rights and civil liberties were Norway, Switzerland, and Finland. Also, uh, the countries with the lowest levels of political rights and uh, civil liberties, um, according to the survey, just were uh, North Korea, Turkmenistan, and Eritrea. This survey takes into consideration uh, a lot of factors, a range of factors when uh, evaluating political rights and civil liberties, including the uh, electoral right. process. Second question, um, in the chapter two, we were talking about the World Bank doing business indicators uh, in the year 2022. So these uh, measure various aspects of the business environment in countries um, around the world. In terms of enforcing contracts, the 2022 Doing Business Indicators reports ranks uh, the countries as follows New Zealand, Sweden, United States, Turkey and India. Uh, this suggests that New Zealand has the most efficient, efficient system for enforcing contracts and has the strongest uh, investor protection and the next uh, country that uh, just below to New Zealand uh, for this uh, World Bank is Sweden. Also in the top ranking are the United States, Turkey, and India. Okay, now I'm back. Question number three. 
My boss wants me to analyze the risk of commercial and political risk in foreign countries. Argentina, Chile, Egypt, Poland and South Africa. I'm not that organized like Kobo. He wrote everything down here on the, on the blackboard or on the whiteboard. I will just go ahead and come. So, Argentina, we all know, and here are some Argentinians in the class. Political risk, pretty high. <laughs> Um, due to political instability, corruption and economic risks. We all know that um, Argentina is most likely not the country where I am, as where I as a business, or business owner or somebody who would like to invest some money, I wouldn't invest in Argentina. Political risk, the commercial risk, high as well, due to currency fluctuation, inflation and difficulty in repatriating profits. So if I invest one billion into Argentina, inflation can eat up my 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 profits, and I'm not sure if I even get my profits back if they're even able to pay me out. So it's pretty risky to due to political political reasons and commercial reasons. So the possi possible corrective measures considered implementing a currency hedging strategy, monitor currency fluctuation and inflation and explore alternative strategies for reputation profits. So this is what is a possible corrective measures are doing. This is what I'm doing as an analyst. If it's good, if it's bad, is it risky or is it a good investment? The next one is China. We all know China is pretty good in terms of commercial. If you do business with China, the, re the, the probability is high, you do get some profits they're gonna pay you out. So the risk is medium due to intellectual property rights infringement, difficulty in enforcing contracts and labor disputes. They are not caring too much about labor regulations. There might be some yeah, struggles and problems if you are outsourcing your car industry and they are not treating the laborers like, or they're, they're, they're not treating the employees pretty well. So that could be a problem. Political risk, medium as well, due to government control and regulations, potential trade disputes and geopolitical tensions. China, yes, they are selling a lot, but they don't like if foreign countries or foreign businesses going into their market and trying to yeah, steal a piece of their cake. Hence, it's a medium thing. It's a medium thing. Um, as I said before, possible corrective measures. Consider establishing strong legal contracts enforcing intellectual property rights and ensuring compliance with labor laws. Next country to our fellow country Egypt from Africa, the politi political risk, as we could expect, pretty high due to political instability, security threats and potential terrorist attacks. We hear, we hear that all the time, uh, almost every month there's a, unfortunately a terrorist attack on the market, in the moschee somewhere so as a business owner or as a country i'm not sure if i would like to invest into a country like that commercial risk as well pretty high due to confrontations weak legal system and difficulty in accessing foreign exchange hence i don't know if i would like to invest my dollars or euros into egypt due to problems in changing my changing my money into their currencies so i might not do that Possible corrective measures. Consider established risk mitigation strategies, such as using local suppliers and partners, diversifying investments and exploring alternative payment methods. Now we're going to our country Poland, which is part of the EU. Hence, political risk pretty low. It's really stable and the membership of the European Union, which means almost like barely no um, corruption, not, not a lot of terrorist attacks and yeah, everything is in order how it's supposed to be. Commercial risk as well, pretty low, due to a strong legal system, a relatively stable economy and a favorable business environment. Possible corrective measures, monitor changes in the political and economic environment, comply with EU regulations and explore opportunities for expansion and growth. So Poland is pr pretty, is a top-notch investment possibility, hence this might be a good recommendation for my boss to um, yeah to look into Poland as a country and as an investment opportunity. And last but not least, South Africa. 
political risk pretty high due to political instability, corruption and social unrest, unfortunately. Commercial risk as well, pretty high due to, again, currency fluctuations, regulatory uncertainty and difficulty in reputating profits. If I don't get my, if I get profits and have difficulties to reputate them, why would I invest my money? However, possible corrective measures. Consider as a business implementing a currency hedging strategy, monitoring regulated changes and exploring alternative strategies for reputating profits. In summary, my friends, Argentina, Egypt and South Africa present high commercial transaction risks due to, as I said, political instability and economic challenges, while China presents medium risk, as I said before. Poland is on number one and as a business owner, I would invest in Poland. I'm going to identify um, where the countries where terrorism threats and political risk are minimal. Um, we have in North, Amer in North America and South America, we have uh, Canada, United States and Uruguay. Uh, those countries are ranked are like the safest countries in the world uh, with low terrorist threats and a stable political environment. Uh, those are Canada, United States and Uruguay in, in the American continent. So in Africa, in Europe, we have Iceland and Norway, uh, which they are considered uh, the safest country in the world too, with virtually no tourism treats. Uh, so for uh, the other side in Africa, in Botswana and Mauritius, those countries are known for their political stability and democratic governance and low terrorist threats. Generally, they are considered as safe, uh, like safe countries with a stable political environment and low terrorist threats. Uh, for the other side in the world, we have Asia, which these countries, Japan and Singapore, uh, they are very safe and they are known for its strong governance and a state political environment with low terms uh, treats as well. And in Oceania, we have New Zealand and Australia, uh, where the terms level is very low and the political environment is very stable. Generally, they are considered as like safe countries and it's very important to know that the level of terrorism, uh, threats and political risk can change over the, over the time and may vary by region within a country. Thank you, thank you. I hope that this video and this explanation uh, help you a little bit to understand a little bit globalization, how economies are interconnected and yeah, we just want to thank you for the attention. Thank you.